Hello, welcome Hello. to Kate's Egg. Today I'm here in Endele of Denmark with Jens Toft, a very good family friend of my family in Montana. You knew my grandfather, Bob Stevens, as well as my great-grandfather from Denmark, Chris Jensen. Yeah, well, I worked for him one summer. He was quite a good boss. And we became very good friends. How long were you in Montana for? Uh, I came in the spring and in the fall I left for New York. I came to Montana from this height where I bought a two-year-old Chevy, which I want to bring to Denmark. Before that, I, I spent the summer, first summer I spent in, in Wisconsin, and there I had a 1934 Plymouth, which was laying behind the farm when I came there. But I got it running and crossed all the way to California in this old car. Wow. Sleeping on the back seat on the way. <laughs> Do you remember my great-grandfather, Chris Jensen? I remember him and also his wife. But I never t talked any to him. I tried, but he answered in English. He didn't want, he didn't want to speak Danish. I, I don't think he forgot. Something like that, like that, you don't forget. No. I don't think so, at least. My family from Montana has been to visit you in Denmark. Yeah, and he also came here. Yes, to the island. Yeah, it was kind of funny. We had one day a visit of the Danish Staatsminister, the Danish Prime Minister, the First Minister in the in, in Copenhagen, and he was here on the island to visit, visit my brother-in-law. And uh, <clears throat> Bob met this minister, and afterwards he said, well, where are all the safety, all the guards that are supposed to be uh, guards around to, to keep safety? But that's not necessary in Denmark. Wow. Did you grow up on a farm in Denmark? Yeah, a brother and five sisters. As a matter of fact, I'm living nearby. When I started my business, I got a bit of land and built my buildings there. So I'm still in the same place where I was born. That's very nice. Yeah. So did you grow up on a dairy farm? Yeah, dairy and pigs. That's what they usually had the Danish farmers. And then you moved on to selling farm equipment. Well, I came to America as a farmer, but got back as a machinery man. I quit working with pigs and cows and bought half part in a small black meat shop and started selling machinery. That went quite well. I sold a lot of machinery. I found out that the best way to make money was was to buy the machinery to the high price. And a lot of factories used to sell to wholesale. And when a blacksmith sold a, a farm machinery, he ordered this machine, it was delivered, and he maybe had 20% discount. But um, I found out that most of the factories would like to sell direct if they get an order in good time ahead, then you get the, the, the machinery to another price. I was selling machinery to the farmers, cheaper as the blacksmith in neighbor town could buy them. And it was easy to make deals when you have the right price. Yes. Could you tell me a story about being in Montana? Well, when about harvest time, Bob told us to get out the combines or get them ready for harvest. The combines was in a shed and the header was removed because the header was too wide to the door. So we got the header fitted and uh, started working the machinery over. And then one day Bob came and asked me about the seat up there. 
Well, I said, that's why I'm going the next three weeks earning $20 a day. Well, you are wrong, he said, because this chain from the header to the touching machine, three chains, is going to pieces all the time and you'll sit there repairing. So I removed the whole chain and looked every piece and found a lot of small cracks. And the 30, the 20, first day in harvest, I had my first breakdown and then I kept on. I harvested more with the whole machine as the first man harvested with a new big machine. But I was one uh, uh, reason because a couple of days it was not in working order because he picked up the stone and got into the machine. And there was a couple of days uh, with, with where it was not in work. And then after harvest, we cleaned the machinery and want to put it inside again. And Bob said, you take off the header. Why do we do that? Well, how the hell are you going to get a 10 foot, a 12, a 12 foot combine through a door, 10 foot door? <laughs> well, I think it could be done. I'll give you $10 if you can do it. So I was doing that I, when the gate was here. I came along the building, and when the header was here, I turned the machine so it went just inside. And fit perfectly. So I went into Bob and said, I want $1,000. The combine is in the, in the machine. You goddamn liar, it's not possible. <laughs> so he went out on Logan and he got his checkbook out, $10. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good story. Did you stay in the bunkhouse when you were in Montana? Sure. Together with the first man, Shorty, Julian Shorty, Shorty, a big tall man. I think he was half Indian, half Norwegian. And he was very happy about whiskey. And uh, one night I was sleeping in my, my bed. Two Van Horn balls came and want to have Charlie with them to, 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 to town. And suddenly one of the Van Horns turned over my bed. And I went out from behind the bed and told him to get out of here. And suddenly he hit me. And we were laying in an empty bed in the corner. But I got around his head and I asked him, you want to get out of here now? And then suddenly, he bite me here. I still have the mark. And then Charlie got out and took the van horn and threw him out. After they were thrown out, I went into the bathroom to have it clean. And coming out, the old man there walked up my ward, my well, I've been bitten. And he, he said, well, don't be sorry because what you made a bit of the van horn, that's a lot worse. That's what I got here. And then he got a bottle of whiskey and poured out of all my... <laughs> Is there still a water reservoir outside the farm? Yes. Behind the bunkhouse? Yes. Oh, I asked Bob if, uh, if I could go swimming there. Oh, that's okay, you can go swimming. I made a... a a 200, a 200 liter, a, a barrel, an oil barrel, lay out and it poured out such a little bite so I could go out and jump out head first. And uh, then they, one day Bob took some of my drink switch was in the front of the front room of the bunkhouse and threw my drinks out in the water so I could go down and pick them up from the bottle. <laughs> one day I tried to Bob had a very nice face, a horse, which I also was riding. And one day I, I tried to get it out in the, uh, in the reservoir and all the way across the reservoir on the horseback. Wow. In the bunkhouse was the old cook. 
she came every year, every spring. She came from oh, back east to feed the hired men. And she was kind of mad because I was swimming in the water. The water that was what she was using for cleaning. Oh, no. Cleaning the, the thing in the house. Drinking water, they, they went down to the river with a tank. And under the bunker, on, on, under the cookhouse, was the tank for drinking water. She didn't like a, a swimming in the water. She was going, going to use for doing dishes. I bet not. Did you drive combine? Sure. That was the old, uh, old combine. I don't know how old. Uh, International SP-125. was quite a good one. Bob, Bob made some invention. He built in a central smearing, greasing system. You just go up on the, behind the seat and there was a pump and there was a, a handle. You pull the handle to one side and you pump until, you pump until the, the handle was in neutral. Then you put the handle to the opposite side and the pump again. And then the whole grease job was done. But Bob said he would never do that again because it was better. The driver went around with a grease gun. Maybe he found some trouble before it got serious. You also had your pilot's license. Well, that was after selling farm machinery. After selling a lot of farm machinery, I got a lot of money. So I decided now my old dream would come through. So I had a flat I bought an old airplane, an English Austro tailwheel, and learned to fly in my old airplane. Not like all the American beer can with a cowboy motor. That's what the British call <laughs> American beer can with a cowboy motor. Uh, wow. All of your children have pilot's licenses now too, right? Yeah. And grandchildren. Yeah. That's very nice. Even my daughter, Hilda, also got a, a grandchildren, two children, one boy, two girls and one boy. Could you tell me a little bit more about farming in Denmark and how you feel it differs from your experience in Montana? Uh, farming in Denmark, that was fields, Growing fields, grain, huh? barley, wheat, hay, some fields with sugar beets for the cows, and uh, of course also fields with potatoes. Farming in Denmark was mostly family farms. Well, uh, the owner and his wife on the farm and had some uh, hired men and girls working on the farms. And, uh, it was the hired men, usually they were hired for a year. From the, first, from the first of November, most of the hired men, many of them changed into a new job and moved to, to the next farm. They stayed on the farm, had also a home for the hired men and they eat with the family. That was the way it was. Uh, the most farm had one man to take care of the cattle feeding and milking, and then one or two or three guys working in the field. Uh, of course, they also, they also had to do something. In the barn in the morning, cowman was milking. While he was milking, they all clean up in the barn behind the cows, pick out the shit. <laughs> so the milking was over, they were feeding some grain and uh, oil cake. You know, they got some something from most from South America where they press out the oil and what's left over that's using for feed for the cows. And then at uh, 7 o'clock usually breakfast, it might be oatmeal or something called oil. Oil was made from rye bread, black, which was cooked with water and so with sugar and milk. If my grandfather watches this, is there something that you'd like to say to him? Because how long ago 
Has it been since you've seen him, since he traveled to Denmark to visit you? What year did he, did he travel here? I don't remember what year. A very year. long time ago, it's though. A long time ago. Is there anything you'd like to tell him through the video? Like maybe say hello? Hello, Bob. Don't drink so much whiskey. That's not, no good for you. Hi, Grandpa. Is that all you'd like to say? Yeah, well, uh, it'll, soon, it'll soon be his birthday, I think. Yes, his birthday was in April. He turned 95. It was in April? Yes, he turned 95. And he told me to wish you a very happy birthday. Oh, I thought I was Elda's papa. My birthday was in June. So he is an old man. <laughs> yeah, Bob had a horse, a very nice horse. It belonged to a man who bought it way up north, but it was running away from him all the time and always heading north. And one day he came to Jim and said, couldn't you fly me over? We find the horse. You don't want to have the horse running around. So, so Jim said, that's a pity. I think he offered him. Ten dollars for the horse. So Jim went away and, and got hold of the horse. And they got it north of the farm. It was an old homestead, almost way over to Jim. Yes. And there was a, a field there where the horse was gas, eating gas. But Bob couldn't catch the horse. When Bob came, the horse was running away. The public horse didn't want to be used as a riding horse. So Bob offered me $10 if I could make a horse so he could catch it. So in that old homestead, I had a bell stand, stand there with some, some wheat and I started feeding the horse. I could catch the horse and uh, the horse knew I had some wheat, but uh, Bob never could never catch it. I don't know why, so I never got the ten dollar. But once in a while, I, I also rode the horse. It was a very nice horse. One day in the summer, the Van Horns had a roundup where everyone, neighbors are coming to take part in, in the party. Where well, there was grill and things like that, and there was the cattle, the uh, little bull cattle was cast on one mark, you know. And uh, there was one neighbor who came in a model T for it. And everyone wanted to have a ride in this model T because there wasn't very many model T anymore. And many didn't, never tried a model T, you know, it's a very special, some very special gear. Yes. With foot gear. Uh, Bob went over in the pickup. So I took the horse and went over. And the van horns said, it's nice to have that with a horse. <laughs> There's been a lot of rain and some roads has been washed away. But also the fence around where they got their cattle has been broken. So I was sent out on the horse to check the fence. But that's also a little very, very special. The, the, the one when they turned over my, my, my bed, the day after, I used to have a revolver, an old one, not a big one, a small one, in a door beside my, my bed. And the next day, well, it was not there. Oh, no. The thing, the van horse, the one, was sitting on Charlie's bed with, with an old 22 rifle. And when they left after the biting contest, they forgot the rifle. But the next day, I couldn't find my revolver. So when coming over to the Van Horn, and they asked me to ride around to check the fence, well, I said, but then I want to have my revolver. Well, he said, you check the fence, then you'll get a gun. When I got back from checking the fence, he came with a old shotgun <laughs> with a string and put it on my neck. My neck, here's your gun, he said. I don't know what, what happened to my revolver. It, uh, at least it was gone after the Van Horn <laughs> visit. Yes. But they left the 22 and I confiscated the, the, the 22. 
That sounds like a good I, I, idea. I took it with me to Fort Denmark. It was old, 22. It's a pump gun with a magazine under the barrel. Well, thank you so much for the interview. I very much appreciate it. It has really been a pleasure speaking with you and learning about agriculture in Denmark and your time with my family in Montana. Yeah. Because you're really like a part of my family. Yeah. That's how my grandfather feels. And you actually have three books published and you're publishing a fourth one as well. So I can include those. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to stay at um, Endelave and it's truly been a remarkable experience to meet you and, and finally hear all of the wonderful stories in person. So I very much appreciate it. I hope when you come to the West Coast, you'll go and see my place. Yeah, you know, the eldest of boys. I would love to. I've really enjoyed seeing Denmark. It's, it's truly a phenomenal country and, and very beautiful. Yeah. Bye.